Thank you, Max, for being here, for taking the time to answer some personal questions about yourself and some further reaching questions about your movie A Day's Work, which um, was presented as the second film of the Film Festival Freiburg. And some viewers may not be familiar with your um, filmographic past, and could you please give us some information about yourself and uh, about your motivation as a filmmaker? I don't think anybody is familiar with my filmographic past, or it's not that large, not that known anyway. Um, no, I, I originally um, studied anthropology and did some film projects um, during those studies, or was interested in film from the beginning on. Um, and one of my final projects of my anthropology studies um, was a documentary short, 45 minutes, not that short, medium length uh, film, that really convinced me that uh, what I want to pursue is film. Uh, I then studied um, film editing in Babelsberg, uh, which is a, in Potsdam, which is on the outskirts of Berlin, Konrad Wolf. I did this one uh, film, which uh, turned out to be a film after all. It was something of a research project, but I was always ambitious in the sense that if I want to make a film, it should be a film and it should be fun to watch in some way or another. Um, and while I think that um, any research findings might be interesting, but it's not what drives my interest in making a film. I do want to be, I do want to have, uh, like I'm interested in actual topics and serious things in, uh, in the things that one would study, but I don't find that film as a research method satisfies me personally as a research me method. I then also want it to be a film. Um, which is not always true. I think in anthropology, there is also a big part of making films, like writing academic texts. And the films that come out of that are something different, which is legitimate and great. It's just, I noticed that really what I want to pursue is, is more the film direction. So then I studied film editing and did some small projects on the side um, and then started a bigger project, which I'm still working on. It's um, feature documentary on tourism development, which in some ways could be called an anthropology of tourism of some sorts. Um, although it doesn't look um, at one single spot very much in detail, but looks at several spots at the same time, kind of trying to make structures and systemic mechanisms visible in a way that I feel become more visible when you look at different places than if you look at only one. And while we were there, we, yeah, happened to shoot this film, uh, A Day's Work. And the other film is still in the works. There's some other small films I've done that have shown at some festivals, but they're years back and I don't think they're worth talking a lot about. So, so you mentioned that you just happened to shoot the film where you were in Burma. Um, did you have a generous idea of what you wanted to make in Burma and then it was just a side project which you saw and took the opportunity to do the film or how should I imagine yeah, exactly. that? Basically it was that, I mean the, the project that my interest in in Burma was about tourism development and my, my interest in tourism development is the ambivalence of development and destruction one could talk, call it or the destructive and the constructive side side of sides of development and that's something that we found on that road but it was not had nothing to do with tourism and we found it in a different way than we were looking for it and we also that we found it as in that was our view on it so yeah we were looking in in that direction and that's how we stumbled upon it and i think what interests me personally also in that film is has a lot to do with ambivalence because we're aestheticizing something that is actually very rough and it's not beautiful and it's not a beautiful reality for a lot of people but then it's also ambivalent again because 
we heard from a lot of people who were working on that construction site or about them later and so on, that most people working there are actually quite happy to work there because it's a good job and it's relatively well paid. And they consider it's, it's not as harsh work-wise than it is working in the fields. So again, the perception gets kind of distorted. That's something that's not in the film, it's just there, but people weren't, they weren't, they didn't feel that they had to, what do you call it, bear the grunt of development and that they have the tough job and other people are having it easy. No, they felt that they got a good job, um, which there's many sides to that. And I would definitely not consider that job great, even not for them. And earlier you mentioned the ambivalence. Um, one, on one side you have the construction of a road, which means you have progress there. And on the other side you have the dumpsters on the side where they just threw the empty bins over and the whole landscape was destroyed. Um, was it just near the street that the landscape looked like this? Or was it the whole area that looked like this? How can we imagine the part of the landscape which was, which was outside the viewing frame? Construction site itself is really, um, um, it was it was just a really short part of the road where we were there. And we also, we only went there for three days and we passed the location for a week, uh, kind of going back and forth and passing it again and so on. So in general, there is, I mean, maybe that answers the question better. A, the, the whole area been logged by first the British, then by the Burmese military, and also by ethnic armies that have that all use the the natural wealth uh, as a resource. So this was not for has for a long time has not been pristine landscapes. They've been destroyed over and over. And there's a lot of erosion in the area. Um, there is, it's more shrubs and not forests. This is an area of Burma that actually should have very thick forests. Locals call it jungle. Uh, I didn't see anything in that area that I would have, that I would have called jungle, which I'm not the authority on that, but I just feel, it didn't feel like jungle. It felt much, like much less. It was very dry often, but that was also the time of year. It's progress and destruction, but that's that is progress. You you seldomly have progress without destruction. And the road is a symbol for the progress in another way because it, uh, as you mentioned at the end of the film, it um, connects five different armed territories. So it is a symbol of maybe a part, a step to the unity of the uh, country. Do you think that was the job or the symbol of the road uh, when you shot the film? Or do you see it now um, after the conflict sparked in the February? Because I, as I think you shot the film before the conflict started to escalate that quickly? Yeah, no, we shot the film actually um, three and a half years ago. We had some different ideas with the footage and then it took some time until it really found that form. And also because it was like a free project, um, there was neither budget nor a deadline, which uh, kind of makes things take longer. Um, no, this was very independent from what happened now. Um, basically, that, that's the sad story about now is that everything that is a topic now was a topic before. And it feels like everything that you were talking about the past in the, in the country and that you feel that was more or less overcome or are the steps to, you know, you feel you have to take it the next step, step they're all, it's, it's like going back 20 steps. And like the country has gone back, yeah, I don't know, 100 steps. And all the things, all the progress that's been made or that you felt was close or you felt it was not enough is so far away now. So no, it, it had nothing to do with what's happening right now in the sense of it was not, it, it was not sparked by the recent development. Um, when we were shooting, we were aware that this was of that, because of that, it was that, that the road was important because it was connecting, because constructing road would have been impossible before, but it was something that everybody needed. And, um, or everybody, yeah, most people, 
needed a road. I mean, again, ambivalent. It also road brings different influences and it brings change. So not all change is always good. Um, but um, yeah, and because of that, actually, that's also one of the reasons it took so long to, to finish the film was that the topic itself that we felt this was interesting and we felt that going through all these, um, yeah, the different territories and playing this role, these different roles, also connecting the places that we felt we wanted to give an, or we experimented with having another layer of, of information of a different voiceover, things like that. But it always, that never, it never worked really. And we just found out eventually that the images were so strong that whatever voiceover, whatever extra layer you would add, would connect, would add too many, it would be a distraction to what's happening. And for my part, what I think was an essential role in delivering the message of the showing what is going on there and how it is done was the sound design in your um, documentary. The, for example, when they tore up the bin of the tar, you hear the clonking of the pickaxe and it was such a sharp, um, it not, was not a noise, but it was like a sound. It was a, uh, almost a melody. Did you manage to get the audio from that from just the set or did you use some Foley design or how did you manage to get those sounds so clearly on a busy road, on a busy construction road? Um, it's a mix of everything. Uh, actually, I don't think there's any Foley. That's the only thing. I don't think we had any Foley. Um, but it's very funny that you mentioned just that one clonk, like the, the that uh, axe or whatever you want to call it, that, that digs into the barrel because that was actually one sound that was not as clear and we had to take we shot the thing several times and we took the sound from a different time that he opened the tar one of the tar barrels because that one was there was some other annoying sounds we had to move things around and made it louder because it felt it didn't have that power but in general it was it's 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 all the original audio um, but of course enhanced to, um, to, to recreate what we perceived and the intensity of it. And also, I mean, there's also like a score music, musical level that also happens. And one of it, there's two musicians who worked on it, Francisca Mai and Izako Chiaf and Izako actually used the sound that we, the original sounds, they're all distorted sounds that work in certain parts. It's not, it's not a lot and it's very subtle, but there is some distorted or reworked, remixed layers of sound that are also underlying, especially during the drone footage. That's where most sound is happening, which is also due to the fact that once you record with the drone, you don't have any sound because the drone is loud and um, yeah. So we used some of the original sound from down below, from on the ground, and mixed those things to create this atmosphere. Where I see a big uh, parallel is you used a two-view panel as a system to deliver the message of your movie. Um, what was the main goal of going in such an unused way? Why did you use two viewing panels in the most shots? Well, I think it was an idea I had early on, or we had early on when we were working on it. And it had to do with the fact that we're not telling a real story. We're telling basically a day's work in the sense of that we, we shot the beginning and the end of each workday. Um, and it's very repetitive. So if we mix three workdays, they, they represent one workday. But at the same time, we're not telling a story. It's not completely coherent. It's not like uh first a happens and then b and then c and then d and then you know it's over of course you can do that on a single in a single channel but in two channels i find that you you can create more of an atmosphere and you have the, the for me nice sensation that the viewer gets to decide where where to look instead of uh instead of being told where to look as soon as there's two pictures as a viewer you have to kind of 
take sides uh, and you just pick what you get to see, what, what to watch and whatnot. And I think it's interesting because it feels a little bit like being on the construction site and not having, uh, not being able to see everything that's happening. Not being, there is something has to do with, I think there's a similarity to why some of the, some that is spoken is not translated is that I think there's something nice about it. If you feel at the end that you took something from it, but also there's still some secrets there. You can watch it again and you can still see something else. There's still, you're not being just, you don't know everything that you've seen. You just saw some of it and you got to make sense on your own. And the whole movie just fits in the scheme of putting one panel in black sometimes to focus your attention on one certain scene. But on the other hand, there was one scene quite at the end where the woman was um, standing on the road and then the whole image was covered with one shot. What, what was behind that one? On the one hand, it's a logical consequence of the form that you can do this. But also on the other hand, it's actually the first time that we really show the road in its, in its whole size. So before you always get, you, you see a certain angle, you, you maybe you see that it's a road, but really you don't just have the road and you don't have that many just really fixed camera angles. There are some, but not that many. Before you don't see the, how many people are there and how many people really are involved. You get an idea that there must be some, but not how many people do what. And it really, it's three men or four working at the tar and more than 20 women delivering uh, gravel. And we felt that there is something, you have to give some significance to it because as Pascal said, who was also very involved, he's this author from this region who was with us there and worked on the film with us. And he said, yeah, it's the women who bear the toughest work and get paid the least, but they're the ones who really, who are really there and who have to, and he, he said, and that's true for the whole country. Did you manage to get any information on how much they got each week or per hour or something like that? Well, per hour is not the category they work in, unfortunately. Um, I think they, they were earning, some were earning uh, three and a half thousand Myanmar chat, which was, which is about three euros a day, which was more than minimum wage or about minimum wage, but that was for the unskilled workers. And to get minimum wage is good. Skilled workers would get 5,000 a day, which would be like 450 or five euros. Maybe it depends. Now with the coup, the, the currency lost a lot of uh, value again. Back then, I just have to think, I, was, I think it was 1,300 zero so yeah it's like 270 and then like four or something like that it's yeah it's nothing and it's pay by the day and the day is 10 hours so i mean it is one of the poorest countries uh, of the world um one thing i wanted to talk about with you was um the parallel of the drone shot and the shots which you did um where you were just near the workers is the intention of those shots to show the ambulance of um, a bird's eye perspective from our point of view and then the other point of view is from the worker or how do you differentiate between those kind of perspectives? I don't think that it's like black and white, but I think, yeah, they both carry, carry this in each of them. So the bird's eye perspective definitely is is the perspective of somebody who is far away and who thinks to get an overview and to have an idea, but has no idea what, what things really look like from close up. Whether the ones where you're close are the perspective of the workers, I would say not for me. I don't think so because I don't think, yeah, I, I just clearly don't have the perspective of the workers. And the worker's perspective would include us in this situation. I mean, we were there. It's not like we weren't there. And um, yeah, the worker's perspective, I think, no, there must be, I'm sure that for them, really different things were, would be interesting than what we did. 
I think what we showed, we were only able to show what we were interested in, which was the working conditions, which I think they also agreed that they were not good, but I think they would have chosen a different way to, to talk about that or to, to visualize it um, if they had the means to visualize them in, in such a way. Um, no, I don't think I can, I, I, would, I would say there, there's, there may be different, yeah, let's call them Western perspectives. It's on, on the rest of the world. One that kind of view, looks from afar and, and sees an overview and another one that is really close and finds just, you know, finds things fascinating, but you really lose track of what, what's kind of the bigger picture, which is normal because you can't, you just, it's impossible to see both at the same time, which is kind of the effect of the split screen. So, so um, on the concluding side now, is there anything that uh, viewers may expect in the future from your side, from Burma, the um, all-inclusive documentary, which you mentioned at the beginning? Is there any date yet when you will uh, publish it or how is that? Well, that's a different story right now. It's been a longer project. We've working on it, been working on it for a while. Um, the, the film is a triptych on tourism in three countries, in three places in the world, which is the hope for tourism, the boom, and kind of the question of what happens when tourism has come and it's there to stay. Uh, the reality is that with what's happened in Burma, I actually just started working on some of the materials that we shot back then to see if we can do something that is relevant to what's happening right now, because the hope for tourism is something is right now, something of the past and things are not looking good that this hope will return. And I mean this like in the most bitter of ways, because while tourism is kind of a two-sided sword, um, compared to what's happening right now, it could have been, it could have been a great thing to happen. Um, for people to come and visit and like culture exchange to happen, even with all the bad sides that we know that tourism can have, which is, I mean, my general interest anyway. And we'll have to see what we can do with the footage that we shot there because we did start shooting and um, we're working on the project still. I just had to move a research trip to Tunisia for the same, or shooting trip for the same, for the same project that I was planning to leave in two weeks. But uh, now all of Tunisia is in full COVID lockdown, like my main project that I'm working on. And um, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be other projects, smaller side projects as well. But this is kind of the biggie that's kind of takes a lot of uh, time and uh, yeah, that eventually will be there. Yes, I think that rounds up the interview pretty good. <laughs> and. Thank you very much, Max, for taking your time and answering all those questions straight uh, through the room. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, nice. Thanks for taking the time to, to prepare all these very concrete and precise questions. Very interesting.